And the final section is devoted to the remedies. So the ways we can overcome multicollinearity, the ways we can deal with it. And some of them I mentioned on the next two slides. The first remedy is quite interesting and it's do nothing. So because multicollinearity is essentially the problem in the data, so it's, it's deficiency. And sometimes we just have no choice over the data, right? So we get the data and we don't have any other data and we have to deal with it. And because of that, we have to accept that there is multicollinearity and um, we have to live with it. So, so in other words, sometimes it is better to do nothing than to make your data worse. If you, if you are not the kind of person that I want to do that, uh, that just want to do nothing, then another remedy that you can do is combine cross-sectional and time series data. So in other words, you can just get a panel data, which, which is a good idea, right? By expanding the data set, we can get rid of multicollinearity. We can also drop a variable. So when you do the formal test and you see that one of the variables is um, collinear, you can just delete this variable and it might solve the problem of multicollinearity. But again, if this is a very important variable for your analysis, please don't delete, leave it. So let multicollinearity be there because I think sometimes the presence of a certain variable is more important than non-presence of multicollinearity. You can also add, um, add uh, new data. So in other words, you can increase the size of the sample. This is also a very good remedy that helps with multicollinearity. And as I, and if you remember, one of the actually one of the sources of multicollinearity is a limited data sample. So that's why it's another reason why it's always better to have a bigger sample. There are some technical remedies for multicollinearity, and they're mentioned on this slide. What we can do is we can transform the data. One of the ways we can transform it is by first differentiating it. So if you look at equation nine, this is the traditional equation. And if you look at equation number 10, this is the same equation, but just in the previous period, right? T minus one, T minus one, T minus one, T minus one. So this, uh, this regression describes the same data set, but, it's just, but it does it in different periods. So in period T and in period T minus one. To get the first differences, what we need to do is we need to subtract equation number 10 from equation number 9. And this is how we get the first differences. This is also a very nice way how we can deal with multicollinearity and sometimes it does help. What we can also do is another type of transformation and, called, and it is called ratio transformation. So instead of taking the first differences, what we can do is we can take, for example, x3 and divide, it and, uh, and divide both sides by it. When we do this, we get y, the dependent variable over x3 is equal to beta1 over x3 plus beta2 x2 over x3 plus beta3 multiplied by 1 plus the error term divided by x3. But obviously, you cannot just take any variable and um, divide both sides by it, it needs to make sense. And most often it makes sense to divide your variables by, let's say, population, right? If you take GDP and divide it by population, what you get is GDP per capita. Or if you take consumption and divide it by population, what you get is consumption per capita. Another example of X3 variable can be the price level, right? If you take GDP uh, in current prices and divide it by the price level, you will get GDP in constant prices. The same with consumption and any, and any other economic variable. So when you decide to undertake ratio, ratio transformation, make sure that your ratio transformation does make economic sense and even any kind of sense, right? You cannot take, for example, unemployment rate and divide GDP by unemployment rate because this econo the new economic variable that you will get will make no sense. So the choice of X3 variable is very important.